Cool. Starting. Receiving your content. Your audience will see it in a moment. Get ready. To have music in the background. Alrighty, welcome everybody to another Layer by Layer. This is live, or this was live. Uh, yeah, so in this tutorial, I wanted to talk about a new project that I'm working on. I am working on the Golden Hammer. This is fix. This is going to be Fix It Felix's Fix It Felix Junior's Golden Hammer. I'm going to uh, design it in Fusion 360, 3D print it, and add some electronics. The goal here is to make a prop that has sound effects. So to do that, I'm using the Adafruit audio effects mini soundboard. This version here has 16 megabytes of flash. And the cool thing about this is it requires no programming. You just plug it into your computer via micro USB. And then you can add sounds like as if it was a, a USB flash drive. And then you can, uh, you can wire up some buttons and uh, trigger sound effects. Or you can use sensors or other things like that. There's, a different, there's many different versions of it, or rather two versions of it. This version of the audio effects soundboard has a built-in headphone jack. So if you already have a sound system, you can just plug in a, a three millimeter, 3.5 millimeter audio cable into the back and get sounds out of that. But since I'm using this mini one, I need an amplifier. So I'm using the PAM 8302A amplifier, which is a really nice Class D amp. And for the speaker, I got this little thin plastic speaker that works pretty good. And then to trigger the audio effects, I'm gonna use this, um, this 16 millimeter a momentary push button. So I just push it once, closes the circuit, triggers the sound. Pretty simple. Uh, so shout out to Kirby who uh, who wrote Instructables and had a how he put together his costume from last year's Halloween because uh, he wanted to be Fix Felix Jr. And what what got me inspired to do this is the hammer, right? So this hammer, uh, he 3D printed this on his uh, Lulzbot Taz and PLA, golden PLA. Looks really cool. Um, and it's on Thingiverse by this gentleman here who designed it. It's designed uh, in two pieces, uh, but I think they're fully solid. A couple of people have made it. So what I did was I designed it in Fusion and made it really hollow and optimized uh, for the components and stuff that I just talked about. So instead of so in this tutorial, what I want to do is just kind of show you guys how to make an adaptive design. And not sure how else to explain it other than showing you what. Uh, What's kind of cool about this design? So you can see I used components. love components. Rule number one, always make a component before you design anything, especially with a part that you know is going to be assembly, rather, uh, a master assembly that's going to be multiple parts. So I designed this with components in mind. So I have most of the things sectioned off, handle, uh, the rod, the hammer base, and the, the head of the hammer. So they're all uh, segmented into their own little components. And a great uh, thing about that is that you get, let me hide my head for a second so that you can see the, the whole timeline. There we go. So you can see um, all of the, the, um, the features that pertain to this component are, are isolated. So that's really cool. And if I bring up the whole uh, master assembly, you can see they're all color coded, which is really nice. So that's cool. All right. Well, what I want to show you guys if like, how, that this design is adaptive in, in a way that I haven't really made it before. So if I double click on, on this feature, which is like the extrusion for the handle, let's say I want to make it smaller, 100 millimeters, I hit OK. Normally what would happen is my design would break, like all of these features would break. But in this case, all the stuff is adapted. So that is really cool. So let me do the section analysis just to show you a cross section of the insides. So there's a lot of stuff in here. There's fillets, there's chamfers, there's coils. Because you know I like coils. Uh, and there's a lot of features in here. Even, even this little guy here, the speaker grill, the holes for the, for the sound to come through, is, is updated. So now let me update um, the rod. Let's say the rod wants to be bigger, like 150. Why not? Again, before, if this wasn't designed in a certain way, things would break all over the place. But because, because this is an adaptive design, everything just kind of flows with it. I think that's really, really cool. Uh, so what I want to do in this tutorial is just show you guys uh, the concept behind it, some of the principles of how to achieve this sort of design, or rather this sort of behavior, I guess, is really it. So that's pretty cool. I mean, a lot of the times you probably won't need to adjust your design, um, but uh, I think in this case it's kind of cool that you can. 
So here's what I'll do. I'm going to start with a rectangle uh, just to kind of make the handle part. It doesn't matter what the dimensions are because we're going to change them. So I got my sketch. Now I'm going to extrude this out. doesn't matter how far because we're going to change it. So let's say that much. And now what I'll do is I'm going to sketch on one of these surfaces. So let's say I want to do a circle on top of this surface. Now when I do that, you notice that the surface becomes yellow. And that yellow is basically saying that there's a, there's a projected sketch here. So here's the first sketch is on the bottom, still there. But now this new sketch, which I'm drawing on, is a projection of this solid. So I'll do what I'll do now is I'm going to draw uh, a circle like right over here. Doesn't matter the dimension. And I'll extrude it out by a certain amount. Doesn't matter what it is. But I'm going to extrude it out and I'm going to hit OK. So now if I free, if I if I drag this around, I can change it. Now watch what happens to the to this. Uh, to the cylinder, it stays in the same spot, which is kind of expected. But the kind of cool thing is if I double click on the extrusion feature of the first square, if I bring this up, you'll notice that the, the cylinder goes with it. So that's pretty cool. But let's say if we wanted to make this cylinder always in the center, like the, the, the exact center, no matter what the dimensions are for this thing. So to do that, I'll double click on uh, our sketch the second one, and I'll drag this circle like over here for now. And what I'll do is I'm going to make some construction lines. So to make a construction line that's always in the center, all you got to do is roll over an edge, and then you'll get this little triangle. That triangle is telling me that's in the center. So I'll make two of them, one uh, going on the X and the other going on the Y. So now you see this that the triangle is there. That's basically saying that this is going to always be in the center of this uh, of a given line. So now to make those constructions, uh, construction lines, I'll, I'll shift select them and then click on this button here to make them in construction lines. And what that does, it just makes it so that it doesn't get like so it doesn't cut this uh, this sketch here. So now I'll drag the center of this circle into the center there, and you'll see the little blue triangle shows up. And now that is always going to be in the center. So I'll hit stop sketch. Now watch what happens when I drag this first sketch around. The cylinder now kind of adapts to that. So this is really cool. This is basically the same principle that uh, my hammer is doing. And again, if I, if I update this extrusion of the first thing, the, the sketch adapts to it because it's linked, it's referenced to that surface. So that's really cool. No matter what the dimension is, it's always going to update with it. I think that's pretty dang cool. So I'm going to make this bigger and then I will, let's, let's draw on another uh, surface because this works not just for one surface, this works for every surface. So let me hit the home button just to get home. And let's say we want to draw a polygon. Where's my polygon tool? Let's say we want to draw a polygon on this surface here. So I'll draw out a polygon, doesn't matter how big. And then you can add constraints. So instead of making it in the center, I'll say from this point to that edge, always be 30. And then from this point to that edge should always be 50. And then I'll extrude this out by that much. So now if I change this design, you'll see that it adapts with it because there's constraints set to it. And again, it works with uh, not just the sketch, but the extrusion. So if I make this really, really tall, it should follow those constraints that I set, the polygon. So that's pretty cool. So that's basically uh, the main principle behind uh, being able to have an adaptive design like that. Again, I don't know when, if your design needs that, but it, I kind of lucked out on this one because I just kind of built it. As I, as I built pieces, I just kept sketching on top of other surface, uh, other solids, solids and surfaces, and it ended up being kind of adaptive to it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I think that's going to be it for this tutorial. That's really all I wanted to cover. Um, modeling uh, this guy could be done in many different ways, but I think the principle is, is, is cooler than the actual modeling technique, or maybe they're both like related, whatever. Like I could have made this where I drew the profile of it and then I like m made extrusions for from this big sketch, but then I don't know how I would have made uh, components for each thing. So I don't know, I think that's pretty cool. What do you guys think? This is live, so. Maybe I'll take some questions from YouTube if there are any.
Hey, look, it's Kirby. I can fix it. <laughs> nice to see you in here. You you inspired this uh, this whole thing. So if anybody, this is all Kirby's fault. So what do you guys think? I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. Do um, you guys want to see the hammer? I have it right here. Uh-oh. I hope uh, Disney doesn't come after me. Yeah, so, uh, it's kind of loud. There you go. So yeah, uh, you moved my stump. yes, I moved your stump. So all the components are in here, like I said. Uh, and the button's mounted right over there. The speaker's in here. This is one of those uh, kind of strange designs where you kind of have to uh, thread things through. That's where the speaker is. You kind of have to thread your wires uh, through certain areas to solder it because you can't like fit a component through here. You know what I mean? Like, there's a that's those are one of those designs, right? So, I don't know. It came out really cool. So big shout out to Kirby for the inspiration on on Fix It Felix Jr. Uh, I planned it to be Fix It Felix Jr. for uh, Halloween. So this is gonna be a project coming up. And um, yeah, if you guys are interested in adding sound effects to your cosplay props, here's how to do it. You, you definitely wanna check this out. Um, sound effects board comes in different sizes. I think there's a, a cheaper one that's like two megabyte version. And we already have like a lot of great tutorials that use it. There's a main tutorial, hop, happy, um, John Parker's happy Chewbacca mask used this. Uh, Becky's uh, dog collar uh, uses it as well. So check it out. Yeah, I think that's going to be it for this tutorial. I just want to do a kind of quick one and show you guys that sort of adaptive modeling technique. I don't know what to call it. I really don't know. Um, but that's about it. Cool. Did you print the cylinder version? Uh, did Desktop makes is asking, uh, did, did you print the cylinder section vertical on the bed? Yes, I did. And I'm glad you asked because I, I actually want to share with you guys another tip. So let me show you the orientations of the stuff real quick. So let's say I have the rod. So here's what it looks like in, 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 in Simplify 3D, my slicer of choice. And what I did is um, I printed it this way, up vertical. And, you know, to keep it on the bed, I added a, a skirt with a zero offset and then just added a lot of outlines to it so that it has a nice brim, right? And when I prepare to print, you can see I got a lot of brim. That's great. And typical, a typical, uh, what do you call it? A typical nozzle for a 3D printer is 0.4 millimeters, like the diameter. And you're usually printing at a layer height of like 0.2 uh, millimeters, right? But the cool thing about the, uh, different nozzles is that you can, you can rapidly increase the print time uh, by a lot. So let's say I have a 0.6 nozzle, which I do. For This is the, uh, the Sigma from BCN 3D. But uh, there's a lot of printers that now come with like nozzle kits where you can change out the nozzle for a thicker nozzle or a bigger nozzle. And then let's say I want to change the layer height to 0.3. And this makes sense for this, this, uh, this part because, you know, it, there's not a lot of detail. And the layer lines don't really show up. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll hit prepared print. And now this print takes 27 minutes, half of the time. This would take a full hour and a half if I were to print this at a, uh, with a 0.4 nozzle with a 0.2 millimeter layer height. So I think that's pretty cool that... Uh, that's where like uh, the benefits of using a bigger nozzle. Uh, obviously, you get kind of bigger layer lines, but you can't really, you really can't see it here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but they, you know, since it's such a big prop, it doesn't matter of the of the layer lines. You can smooth it out, you can sand it down, and do all sorts of finishing techniques. Uh, another part where this kind of really made sense was the biggest part, which was the handle. So again, instead of printing it flat like that. I printed it on on this surface here, this surface here, up up you know vertical like that. No supports required for it because there's not really that much overhang. The the little circle cut out kind of catches itself. And if I prepare to print, you'll see it takes an hour and fourteen minutes, right? But if this was a 0.4 nozzle with a two millimeter layer height, let's see what that would be. So let me change it back to 0.4. And then back to point two, hit okay, prepared print. 
we're looking at three hours to print this. And that's typically what I would do, but man, that, that 0.6 million nozzle, it's, it's beneficial. So, I don't know, that's a cool tip. Cool. Um, Scott, Scott Lockie just ordered a nozzle kit. So this is great to know. I know, right? Isn't that awesome? So if you're printing really big things and don't have a lot of detail, I think it works out. It, even for how thick are the walls? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see how thick the walls are. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think it's just uh, two shells. The thickness of the wall is is going to be, I guess, 0. 0.6 millimeters or point. Yeah. There. It, it's it's pretty tough too. It's 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 not uh, it's not like weak because the layer the the actual extrusion lines are pretty thick. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. So, does that? I hope that answers your question. Are there educational licenses for Fusion? You betcha! I'll have a download link down below. If you go to any of my Lair Belairs, I always have a download link, and um, it's just like a download link that that tracks how many people downloaded it. But you can download it anywhere. Uh, it's just go to autodesk.com slash fusion or just search for Fusion 360. Yeah, uh, I'm using an educational license because um, I'm not using this for commercial use. I'm not selling my design, so it works out for me. And if you are, uh, it works out for makers who make under, or, or companies rather, that make under $100,000. And so you get it for, uh, I think it's a year subscription. And then after that year ends, you just renew it with that same license. So that's pretty cool. So Fusion's really, really changing the game with that. So check it out, writer. Check it out. All right, if there's any other questions, let me know. Uh, I haven't done a live Lair Belair in a while, but it made sense because my screen capture recording software just keeps crashing on me. And this is the, the alternative. Yeah, this will be like next week's project or something. Uh, not next week, but the week after, which has gotten pretty close to Halloween. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's going to be it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Simplify 3D versus Cura. Oh, man. That's, you yeah, know, I mean, they're both great. I support both of them. Uh, I obviously use Simplify 3D, but uh, I'll use Cura every now and then. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Um, let's see. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool, guys. All right, guys. Well, have, enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck with all of your uh, future maker projects. But until next time, remember to keep on fixing. <laughs> Bye, guys.